Sportscast SA presents Game On. Game On. South Australia's destination for everything sports. Local, national, and international sports. AFL football, soccer, basketball, golf, baseball, tennis, cricket, and any other sports played in this wide world. And we're going to have a blast doing it. So sit back, relax, and let's do this thing. Welcome to Game On. Welcome to Game On's Summer Series. Happy New Year to everybody. This episode is part of our Summer Series. This is part two. We had a look in part one at the cricketers. We had Wayne Phillips and Rick Drewer. And as part of today's episode, we thought as we've turned the new year, we'd have a little bit of a look at the footy and the SNFL. But we are going to relive a couple of our favourite interviews for the Game On podcast with John Wynn and Rodney Maynard. Please sit back and enjoy and thanks for listening. Past players, past legends, past legends. Today, John Wynn from the Nord Football Club, but previously from the West Perth Club as well. A Hall of Famer, South Australian Hall of Famer, West Perth Premiership player, and of course, coming over here to the mighty Redlegs Premiership player in 75 as captain and 78, and 82 as an assistant coach, Malcolm. Yeah, welcome, Winnie. How are you? How are you, well, great thanks, man? Malcolm. All good. Yes, Jonathan Francis Wynn. Uh, now, yeah. Winnie, we want, let's start... With uh, with Western Australia and a man who's had a uh, huge influence on on uh, you and not only your footy your life because I actually want to expand a, a little bit on this as well. Let's go with Polly Farmer to start with. Uh, two eight. Yep. Expand. Um, yep. Well, expand. Well, Paul uh, was playing football in fifty six, fifty seven, and I would have been about nine or ten at the time. And it was uh, he was just a, um, a fabulous athlete at the time, a legend in West Australian football. And it was God bless Mummy and Daddy and God bless Polly. And uh, he was just held in such high esteem. And when he went to Geelong, uh, half of Perth finished up becoming Geelong supporters. And I guess a lot of people still are today because of because uh, when he went there. And it was. Um, was was a great uh, great experience after uh, playing a couple of years of senior football, and he turned out to be our our coach. So it's um, look, a lot of that stuff still goes on today. I think where the guys who are ahead of you, who you uh, who you admire, and your who are your idols as a kid growing up, and uh, there's been a few fortunate kids around that have managed to play with them, and uh, I was I was one of them, and uh, it's just just like his his impact on on club on, on the club. Uh, such a, a man with humility. Uh, he was never really, he's never a self promoter. I said to him one day, Paul, you never talk about yourself. He said, I leave it up to others. So uh, it was just, um, just a, a very humble, beautiful man. And John, you've maintained a relationship with Polly right through to the end of Polly's life. And Polly suffered from Alzheimer's. Um, go. Look, my mum's just passed away from it. My mum had no idea who anyone was for about the last three to five years, and it was just terrific. But, yeah, share your experiences with that side of things with Polly, mate. Oh, when I came back to uh, Western Australia um, after living in Adelaide for some 14 years, um, I just picked up the f- with all my old teammates and and and, and Marl and the kids. Um, yeah, it was... Uh, so when I went to uh, South Australia, um, the kids were all young. They were all in their uh, you know, nine and ten. And when I come back, they're all they're all teenagers. They're all growing up. And we just finished up. Uh, you know, both our families got together, go out. It's just uh, just a great. You had a great philosophy on life, um, and had a great sense of humour. Wonderful sense of humour. I'd get in the car every morning. We'd pick him up, and he'd say, "Have you said sorry this morning, John?" Because that was what uh, John Howard was about. It's, it's just his, uh, his his outlook. You know, he is with 
the Aboriginals, he said, they've been here for 20,000 years. You just can't expect them to change in 200. And it was just uh, his his way of life, his his actual thinking. He thought differently for a for, for a fellow that was brought up in a in, a, in an orphanage. Um, the things that he that, that he got up to and the way he thought. Um, first time I ever went to the race, because I went with him, and he bought two programs. He put one in his hip pocket, one in his uh, jacket, and he'd had a couple of bets. And the bookmaker said to him, how are you going today, Paul? He said, I'm going no good. Well, I'm sitting, I'm standing there listening to this. Hey, give us your program. He gave me his program and he marked it off. Went along a bit further than one of the leading trainers. How are you going, Paul? I'm going no good. And he gave him the other program. We went and sat in the stand and he compared the trainer's program with the bookmaker's program. I said, why did you tell him you're going no good when you already had a collect? He said, they try harder to find you a winner if they think you're losing. <laughs> and so... So where did, you know, like he came up with this philosophy where he was self-taught, self-educated in a whole range of things in life. It was, um, it was a great experience uh, being with him. Um, we're on the Goliath tour in, in, um, in Ireland and we're on a double-decker bus and we pulled up the bus stop and it's got betting. He's out we get. We go up to this little betting shop, grab the form guide and pick seven winners. Uh, it's just... Just, just uncanny. He, uh, he bred horses. He had a, one of the one of the, had a large um, uh, on on stallions and studs. The whole bit, whole bit where he had all the all the magazines and the books. Kept, just it was it was a great interest for him. And, and his his betting was it was he was criticised for it. But what he was, he was a small gambler in in a sense that he'd pick novelties. He would go for the quartets and the trifectas. Yep. And uh, he got some amazing results with his with his analytical brain. He just great analyzer. He was telling us things in the '60s that they still don't do today. He always said uh, he was, was well ahead of his time. He was, he, yeah, he was. Like, don't kick the ball at him. Kick it out in front of him. Let him run onto it. Well, that's kicking the ball to advantage. Yeah. You know, throw the ball out in front. Let him run onto it. Well. That, that is not taught today. All they say is you kick it. They don't say kick it to advantage or handball to advantage. It's just, it just he was, as, as you said, he was ahead of his time. And then I you... said to him one day there uh, about the handball. I said, why did you come up with the handball? He said, I could win the ball. He said, but if I could give it to somebody who was five or ten yards out and they could advance down the ground, that would be, a, instead of my kick, it would be a kick and a half. And he said, then I can get set when the ball came back, if it came back. You know, so just his whole philosophy. Um, I don't believe the Victoria saw the best of him. He played his best football here. And that's according, that was going by a couple of his teammates at the time, that when he went to Melbourne, he had to reinvent himself because of his, uh, his, his knee. He, right. had a, he did a cartilage in. And in those days, he didn't come back from cartilages. And at, at a function, uh, Bob Davis, the Geelong coach, said he was the first player to come back and recover from a, a, a cartilage operation. Okay. So there's just a whole range of things that are uh, very unique. When we were, uh, we were playing in the carnival in Adelaide, and uh, it's written up in the advertiser that morning, uh, Farmer versus Nichols. And I said, what will happen today, Paul? He said, John will hit me, I'll hit him, and then we'll play footy. So it was just, yeah. And he went on to win the Simpson, Simpson medal in that game. So it was just, uh, yeah, a wonderful experience as a kid growing up, idolising this man and then spending, you know, the, the later years of his life um, with him. Yeah, no, it's just, just great. Yeah, look, we're pretty emotional on that topic as well uh, too, eh? Uh, your decision then to come to the parade, thank goodness, um, you know, Carmel Court, where you, the College of Knowledge, where you were the head prefect. You know, you think of the people who boarded there: Michael Taylor, Phil Carmen, you know, the late Jim Till and Glenn Rosser, Greg Turbel, Neil Craig, Danny Jenkins, Neil Button, Ian Stasnowski. We go on and on. You know, like that'd be a fair AFL side, let alone you know, and that Nord was sort of ahead of its time in that regard. Wow. There too, too, and and Wally and Jim Balderstone side of things. Uh, there uh, too, eight. Yeah, look, I, I think that uh, that set the stage 
for the future coming out of the uh, out of the 60s into the 70s. And what I mean by the future is that all those guys were all so humble and the humility that exists amongst them. Um, and that's the big thing about Norwood. Wally Miller was never a self-promoter. And all the, all the Norwood presidents, and to this day, they're not self-promoters. They're sharing, caring people concerned about the people behind the, behind the scenes, like our trainers and our administration people, our volunteers. The Norwood Football Club is, is an amazing um, institution, I believe. And if you look at our three, our three champions, as in our greatest player ever, Gary McIntosh, um, Michael Taylor and, and uh, Michael Ace. They, they, they've never been self-promoters, and they've promoted this humility. And it's just been uh, it, what it's done. It's attracted people not only from the for administration, but also our sponsors and people that have been around for years and have never got much praise about it about, about being sponsors and, and just the silent givers, like the Cradle family. Yep. Um, and, and the Cooper family have been involved for a century. It's, it's, it's an amazing institution. And I was very fortunate to, uh, to uh, stumble onto it and, and make that call to go to Nord. Um, it came about because uh, Damien Nygaard came to West Perth in, uh, in 60, at the, halfway through 69. And I thought, my, here's my way out of here because I wanted to go to Victoria. And at the time, they had the, the thing called the Coulter Law. Coulter Law, yeah. And it was, you, uh, they kept uh, Sid Jackson and a couple of players out of football in Victoria for two years. And I thought, what I'll do is if I go to South Australia, I can go into the back door to the VFL. So I organised to uh, come over there. Bert Balderstein came over, met with him and Ron Kneebone, and then went over... Uh, at the end of 69, after the season finished here, um, and there was uh, there was a player swap involved. Uh, Graham Malloy went to from Norwood to Melbourne. Uh, Melbourne cleared a guy by the name of Steve Arnott to West Perth, and who was still involved at West Perth today. And not, Norwood cleared Nygaard to West Perth, and West Perth in turn cleared me to Norwood. And uh, Norwood would not have won that one too, eh? Well, I, I don't know about that, but anyway, it was uh, it was just a great experience to uh, to um, be involved in those early years, and particularly at Carmel Court, um, where uh, it was just that was a, that was an amazing experience. That's that was the club with inside the club, and inside that club developed the team within the team on the ground. I remember uh, Bob Hammond there one day. He uh, he threatened uh, Glenn Rosso. If you don't get a kick today, Glenn, you're out of the team. And uh, we've got halfway down the race. And I stopped the boys and I said, fellas, all you Carmel Court guys today, we give the ball to duck. So at half time we've gone in and Hamo said, you're right, you bastards, you got me. Duck had 25 kicks. <laughs> wow. It was just, uh, so you just, we, yeah, it was just a great, you'd, you'd go out of a night different places around the town and you'd see one another and everybody looked after one another. It was just a great, great feeling. And I, I think that, 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 uh, that went right through the, right through the club and the environment. And I, I think a lot of guys have sort of tuned into it. Um, yeah, Nor is a very, uh, very compassionate. It's not a ruthless club. It's a very, very compassionate. Maybe, uh, we could have won more premierships, but I think, Assess what the guys have gone on to do with their lives after after Norwood. I think there's been a lot of successful guys have come out of that environment, and uh, I, I just uh, I just think back how fortunate I've been. I always love that you see the full picture too, Winnie. Um, Pardon. I always love that you see the full picture, and not people just think of exactly as you're saying. A lot of clubs just judge people just judge any club by a number of premierships and not and don't see the whole picture. Well, it's, they're, they're all trying to win a premiership. They're all going to do it next year. But you need to lay the foundations, and you need you need to recruit just as good as people off the ground as you are on the ground. You need to have standards, and I, I think uh, I think it's a credit to uh, to Jay, the, the current coach. From what I understand and what I've been told, he's managed to tap into uh, the culture and, and cultivate 
the, the uh, some of the players of past uh, to to be involved, which is which is good for them, uh, good for the club, and I, I think that uh, that extends the, uh, the the tuition. I, I think there's a, there's a gap between people from the the 60s and the 70s of how do you communicate with them today? They're not on they're not on Twitter, they're not on Facebook, but uh, I, I think you can do it on one to one where where the coach can tap into some of the past players of involvement who've got the right sort of, who understand the culture, who can help tutor the younger fellows coming through to the club. I think, I think the sandful and the waffle, it's a stepping stone to, uh, to the AFL, but there's a lot, I, I think they take the kids too early. Yes. And I, I'd, I'd, I'd prefer them. I reckon you've got a better chance if you go later in, later in life. Not 18 and 19, and I think there's uh, they cast too much to the wind. They say they they're going to look after these kids, but uh, I don't believe it's better. Like Keith Thomas, Keith Thomas was a very skillful player. He was drafted by Hawthorne, and he went over there. Hawthorne or Fitzroy, one it's, of the two clubs. Fitzroy, 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 and I think his coach at the time was. Uh, it was a well-known... Walls and Park and... Yeah. Mm. Yep. Park and Park yep. yep. I mean, when Keith came back, his skills, they they were off by 50%. And it was it was all more... They, they, taught, they, they, don't, they, they never placed the emphasis on, on, on the skills like we did in the environment that we created at Norwood. All the Victorian players, they're all great marks. They were better marks than, than what we were, but they're kicking... And their, their skill wasn't as good. I, I just think that there's been more development of the game uh, in, out of South Australia because you've had the, you know, the, the three three leading coaches who were there for 20 and 30 years between Foss Williams, uh, Jack Odie, and Neil Curley, and they all they all had their own different philosophy. And I think when you look at Mark Williams, what Mark Williams has gone on to do with his uh, football career uh, at, in coaching. And when Mark played, and to where he is now, and how he understands the game, uh, and the environment that he was out of, I, I think he's modified a lot of his thinking towards the game, which is which is great because he's evolved. Which is sometimes you get typecast in an environment, and it's hard yeah. to break the mould. But I, I believe he has. Speaking of uh, skills, mate, your first coach was uh, Robert Odie. Um, you know, certainly uh, at, Norwood, yeah. at Norwood, yeah. At Norwood. And um, you know how uh, how was that experience? Uh, Robert um, Robert was a, a good football skills coach. Um, Robert had went to school, teachers college, and back to school. He never never mixed commercially in the, in the world of uh, commerce and had an understanding of that and the people that were involved in it. Um, he he tended to prejudge people, and uh, he, he pre prejudged me on occasions. But uh, you can't catch me because I don't drink and I don't smoke and I never have. So uh, it was um, it was an unusual unusual relationship. Um, that's why, in the end, after the end of '73, um, I, I I made my my commitment was to go to Norwood for two years or not at all. And after I completed that commitment of three years, uh, Paul was coaching Geelong at the time, and I rang Paul and said, "Look, uh, I wouldn't mind coming over." And uh, that's that's uh, so. Uh, I set, set the deal was set. I was going to go, and then uh, what, what, then they uh, they finished up sacking Robert Odie, and uh, I decided to stay. And the rest is history in that regard yeah. too. To it, um, let's yep. go, let's let's go for a bit of fun. How much? Uh, and it's funny where you said yeah, non drinker, and I reckon there'd be that many people around who thought thought at the time there'd be th- around Winnie and think, geez, Winnie smashed, and no, it was just Winnie was just. The king and you just played people on a break. Um, Sam's disco uh, to eight your involvement there. Yeah, I was I was fortunate enough to take over the management of that from Ron Tremaine. Ron Tremaine was an entrepreneurial. He was involved in the uh, festival arts, I believe, and he was appointed uh, manager of the uh, Lion Hotel in the early seventies. And uh, it was he was involved in the building program and he was he was busy so he stepped down from running it and um, I was fortunate enough they uh, they appointed me to run it 
and I ran it on the same basis that uh, that, I, that that I like places that I like to go to in Perth. So all the places in Perth that uh, had played top band 40 commercial music, they drew the crowds, and that's what we put in. We just put put in uh, the top commercial bands. 5 AD at the time were on top playing commercial music. That's what we played. Uh, we had Bob Francis as, as our uh, as our that's DJ, right. and um, we ran it to a standard. Uh, no swearing, wear a tie, behave yourself, or you get thrown out. Yes, and so, we all uh, remember going up the to... back stairs through the kitchen. Had to... Winnie, that was always good fun. <laughs> yeah, well, we had a, our crowd controlling engineers were uh, uh, Neil Button, yes. uh, Phil Carmen, um, Jim Tewis. Hugo Colasanti, uh, Michael Ace. Uh, we had a fire attendant. We had a fire attendant. That was Neil Craig. Right, yeah. So we had all the young guys uh, who were putting themselves through school and who needed the extra extra buckaroos. So it was, um, yeah, it was, uh, and it was good to have them around and in, involved. It was uh, the place to be on a Saturday night for the uh, for the younger kids. If only we could invent a time machine, mate. I'd love to have gone. Oh, Would have been amazing. Memories. So uh, yeah, so look, seventy eight. And people go on and try and make out there was so much in the whole Jack Odie thing. It was, as usual, you were just the king of bluff. You'd, you'd thought of it pre- before the game, that there was a yep. chance, and really yep. not much happened. No, nothing, nothing nothing happened. It was, it's like most people can't tell the difference between your ass or your elbow. So it's, um, you know, people just, uh, anyway, they, people read into what they want to believe. It doesn't matter. There was no, there was no punches thrown from my on my behalf. It was just uh, I didn't have to, and I it was all it. just uh, good day, boys. How are you? And that that was enough to uh, upset a few people. So that's that's fair enough. Sandy Roberts, but, the next uh, Sandy Roberts, the next day on the on the footy show, and John, I've got to ask you about the incident in the coach's box, and can you remember your reply to it? Oh yes, yes, yes. It was appropriate at the time. <laughs> You never miss an opportunity to jump into a box. <laughs> yes, as always, you nailed it. And you know, then your involvement uh, with a uh, fantastic partnership with Barmy, in, uh, especially in 82. Oh, Neil, Neil, was, Neil was a man's man He's, and, and a gentleman as well. And uh, I, I can't speak highly enough of him. Um, I caught up with him a couple of weeks ago. Um, he's back to playing weight. It's amazing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware that um, he, when I played here, he was a 16 or 17 year old kid playing a few games for Subi. And uh, he actually rucked. He mentioned that he, he rucked against Polly one day. His first when, game. When he was, his league debut. When he, when he's a 16 or 17 year old kid and. Uh, I didn't. I, was, I knew he played for Subi, but I didn't know it was in that particular game. But um, yeah, look, it's great. Uh, you, what happens is, as you're coming through the system, everybody is involved in doing what they're doing, and years later, you don't realise just uh, how good was this bloke? How good was he? Like, like Greg Nicholson. Nico would come to training, and he'd go home, and we'd have to drag. It'd be like pulling teeth to get him to go to a function. Anyway, years later, after all the footy's over, we catch up. And you just think, how good is this bloke? And you start to look around and you think, look at our, uh, our, our history, history group, led by Michael Colligan, um, Roger Woodcock, and, uh, and Shorey. And the guys who are, who are Win- cultivating... Yeah, Winton and Graham Adams, yep. All that, so many people that are involved behind the scenes, and, and they're just... Beautiful quality people. Um, it's like some of the trainers when we have a function, Mel Phillips and his crew. So they're still around, and that's uh, that's the great part about it. A couple of practical jokes. Uh, you, you know, I've never, I've always loved one in particular. One night in the in, you know in the Red Leagues Club, and you've seen Ashley Porter in the corner, and you've uh, you let the word around to people, and uh, you've slammed it, you know, thrown it something on the floor and you've gone, oh, I've had a gutsful bloody bears, bears, you know, pissing off to Port Adelaide. And he stormed out, walked out the door and you just walked around the corner, came back in the other room in the blue room and there was Ashley Porter walked out about five minutes later, back page of the news on the Monday, Button, Button wants to, the bear wants to go to the port. 
sure enough, for a traction the next day. But I'll give Ashley Porter his due. He took that pretty well. Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's a great rapport between some of the blokes. Like, uh, over the years, we've had, uh, like, uh, Rochi. Um, there was him. Um, and a lot of the guys from the, from the West were, were uh, Shieldsy, Alan Chef, Shields. Yep. So they're all, you know, blasts from the past. You know, most of the people Mike that Howard. saw us play in the, in, the, in the 70s now have all passed on. You don't realise it's... Uh, it's, it's uh, 50 years ago. And, uh, yeah, it is. 45, 50 years ago. Now, Pete. So, we had our day in the sun, so that's fine. Pete, uh, so there's one day, Winnie's, uh, Winnie's gone right. Can you remember what you called us, uh, 228? Can you remember what you called myself, Jeff yeah. Wilson and Peter and, uh, and Walshy, Bob Walsh? Yeah, you, yeah, the elves. <laughs> and Winnie's gone, I'm going to shout you guys lunch, and there used to be the John Wynn stand, the little bit on the side and yep. that. And, and over comes Dave Parsons, the kid barman at the time, and he's got this, this silver you know, plate and it's all enclosed over the top. And we're thinking, geez, He's got the cloche on it. I'd love to know what Winnie's yeah, – Winnie yep. shouted us here. Yep. And he lifts it up, three packets of chicken chips and three <laughs> cans of Coke. <laughs> and it was just – it was vintage. It was vintage 2-8. You don't want to spoil them. <laughs> Not too much, anyway. Now back on one serious one, Wally Miller. Ah, uh, well, there's 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 not much you can't say about him. Um, you know, just a, a beautiful man. He's uh, when you look at uh, when you think you're going rough, you've only got to think about about Wall, and you go through some of his issues that he's had in his life, and uh, and and there he is. He's um, He's still as still as sharp as uh, I call. I, I ring well every Thursday, um, and we just talk talk shit. And it's just a great gr- great rapport. Wonderful man. Um, there's nothing the boys wouldn't do for him. I believe he kept the lid on the whole shooting match, um, and he was just just such a great navigator around issues that we had at the club at different times. Um, everybody, everybody kept their cool with him. He he kept. It was just just an unusual, unusual individual. Um, for him to evolve into what he was at, at, at the football club for that for that period of time, and and to still be active today in in, in what he in in his life. Um, it's an amazing, amazing story, an amazing individual that. Uh, that yeah, I can't speak highly enough of him. And for people out there who don't really know Winnie and probably, uh, you know, hopefully getting to learn, know a little bit more compassion just listening to this side of things, I compared John very much to Ian Chapel as a leader and that uh, Winnie is the he's the he's also the leader. Of, he always knows everything what's still going on at the parade. John still knows everything. The care and compassion he has for everyone. Someone falls... Falls down the crack, one of Winnie's favourite sayings, or there's a player set, whatever. Winnie's even from Perth. He's contacting us, hey, blah, 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 can you mm-hmm. go and do that? And yeah, no, unique leadership in uh, Jonathan Francis. How did the two, how did you, it become that you've effectively not got known and you're one of the very few people known basically through your number, through 2 8? Was, was there any particular thing how that first started? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's maybe, well, there's a two eight pet parrot, and the parrot does. Is that, that two, I don't know whether the parrot talks too much, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Only you, Winnie. But anyway, uh, going just just going back, uh, mate, to your uh, your career. You know, you um, you captain Norwood in uh, was it seventy five? Captain the Premiership side, yeah. Yep. Yep, um, and obviously, uh, you know, broke the twenty-five year premiership drought. I mean, that's fantastic for the club. How did you feel? Oh, look, it's looking back on it now. It, it was just, uh, it was, it was a great experience. It's things you don't forget in life. Um, there were just so many people uh, who were emotionally involved on the day that you know brought tears to their eyes, and it was just, just a wonderful, uh, it was just a wonderful effort of of all the things that people had put in place, you know, 
four or five years before that, how it all managed to come to fruition at the right time, and 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 just just having been there, uh, yeah, look, it's um, yeah, those things stay with you, and the people do too, uh, and un unfortunately, there's a number of them that have moved on in uh, in life now, but um, yeah, it was. Uh, just just an emotional time and I, I think there's a there's a bond between all those people that um yeah you, you you get together you don't get together as much as you used to like as in uh the reunions and that in the old days the reunions would go on till two and three in the morning and now now they're uh, they're home by five or six but uh they're all we're all getting a bit tired but uh it's yeah there's a lot of it, you have to have been there, I think, at the time to 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 appreciate it. And the same as the young lads that have won the premiership this year. That's an, that was an amazing, amazing effort. Oh, that, sensational! Uh, that, that, and they they are so fortunate. They are so fortunate, those lads, that um, that 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 they're at the right place at the right time. And uh, yeah, that will be with them for for, for the rest of their life. And they've got to, they've got to hand that that feeling on to the next generation coming through. And the same as the guys who were around when we won the three together. You know, those guys. You, you, you finish your footy, you go off, you have your family, and you get involved. But you need to come back. You need to get the right people back to keep the culture going. And that's that's the important thing. That Norwood's got a great culture, got great successful people that they call back into the into the fold. I believe Neville was there this year. Yes, I was going, uh, to, helping with I was going to add Neville. Was, yeah, it was actually interesting yeah. where Ben Jarvis lining up for a goal in the last quarter. And look, he struggled a little bit at various times, kicking for goal. And as he's lining up for goal, I mean, it's actually, yeah. I'm wrapped he's so far out because this is going to make him do what Neville had been trying to get him to do for three months, was kick through it. And he, and he it. absolutely yeah. nailed it. Yeah. And I thought of Neville straight away. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, it's that's uh, that's all part of the culture, part of the history of the Norwood Football Club, and, and it's just wonderful that it uh, that it all fell into place at the right time. One quick one back you know, like, on a, as far as I'm concerned, the forgotten premiership almost, and because it, it wasn't a great game, and probably you, you can comment on it more than anything because of your knowledge of WA footy was the '77 Art of Cup against uh, East mm. Perth, one of the great games. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was a. It was a lead up to '78, and we were laying the, laying the because the following year was our centenary year, and and the effort that the club was putting into it, recruiting people and and and, uh, and building towards the team, was uh, that was that was where our focus focus was uh, for the '78. The '78 was a was an unusual team because half the guys never played the first half of the year. Yeah, it's true. There were a few come came in. Yeah, Philip. Yeah. Phyllis Noonan, so, Adamson. Yep. Yeah. So it was, yeah. So it was. Yeah. But um, no, look, it's it, what you you never write Norwood off. They uh, always come back. Uh, great people. Um, I, I, Michael, Michael Taylor was unfortunate that he played in the era of Barry Robin and uh, and Russell Ebert. Because they had they had a mortgage on the medals every year, but but Kingo was up there. He he, he was right up there with all that sort of stuff. Oh, Kingo's um, game and Kingo in eighty, it's it was far school that he didn't win the medal in eighty. And he, and to Russell's yeah. credit, he made point uh, one yeah. night we're doing uh, a fundraiser with him, and he said, "Hey, biggest pants down job I ever got in my career was the eighty grand final by Kingo." Yeah, Russell was Russell was a beautiful man. Russell mm. love Russell. No, we got we got on pretty well. Yeah, no, yeah, great things with Russ. Who, who was your toughest opponent uh, during those uh, those Halcyon years? Uh, I, I was fortunate enough. I, I didn't have to play on Barry Robin, and I was fortunate enough I never had to play on Russell. So they they were just the standout players in that in that era. Um, you know, to try to compare people. In different situations, in different eras, and different decades, it's it's, hard. it's, uh, it, it's difficult. But all, yeah. all you do is you have you have your favourites, and uh, I, I think they those two boys were just uh, ornaments to the game, wonderful people, 
and they kept doing stuff and you know contributing to the community well after their after they had their uh, their, their career was over. It's um yeah that's they're, they're the sort of people that I people that I I respect and got a lot of time for. Now it's a state game. Uh... Is it correct? Is it is it footy folklore or correct? It was a state game? You sitting on the on the pine, and took extension cords with you for electric blankets. Uh, you and Malcolm Blight on the bench. Is that correct? No. What happened there was that's when they were promoting that Sustigen, and right. Blight himself stood back. We stayed back at half time, and got all the Sustigen and the pineapple. I reckon we had a pineapple each. And about two tins of that sausage, and we went out and sat on the bench with our guts full. And uh, they've come down and curly said, "When are you on?" I said, "No, no, 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 you go on." Anyway, before anyway, Blighty finished up going on, and uh, I couldn't, but not go on later on. But uh, yeah, okay. No, the, the the heater. No, I had a heater at uh, Football Park. Yes, because they had a PowerPoint there, and it was uh, they used to call it Arctic Park. And uh, in, in the in the little dugout there, so yeah, I had a heater. Heater, right? Little so heater it was, was close. Coat. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, obviously, uh, your uh, life membership uh, to uh, um, Norwood in nineteen seventy nine, but obviously in um, two thousand and one, you're uh, named in the team of the century, and in, uh, and inducted not... into the Hall of Fame as well. Uh, look, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. Someone out there loves me, but you know, I, I I don't see it as all that. But you know, it's, uh, it's yeah. Look, it's um, yeah. No, I I don't go there. All the all the stuff, all the footy stuffs in a box in the garage. Um, I don't uh, I don't dwell on the past. Hey, but what are you? What are you? Let's go. Let's go back to now, Winnie. That's more your cup of tea. Hey, what are you though? West right. Perth going top as well. Yeah, we were very fortunate there. Um, we had a um, we had a had a function with all that used to be known as the Cardinals. Yes. And uh, we had a function for all the uh, past players, all the old Cardinals, the guys who played at Leederville, and, and uh, we had a function there. And I I went as a Cardinal. I dressed up. <laughs> Had the uh, Cardinals outfit, the hat, the whole lot, and I had the big car. I've never had so many people kiss my ring in one day. <laughs> I actually remember you giving giving us giving me a tour of Leaderville when I was in Perth when you were you were coaching West Perth and you gave us a tour of the ground. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of. Well, I was I was there as a kid when West Perth uh, won a grand final uh, in 1960. 60, yeah, 60. I used to go down there every night, watch them train catch the bus down, um, yeah, so as a kid kid growing up, didn't finish up playing for them, which is, uh, which is very, very fortunate. That's... Oh, look, Winnie, greatly appreciate you know, your time. You're a legend of uh, the Nord Football Club. You're a legend of football more overall. Um, you know, we've obviously got to wait and see now, uh, talking about the Alzheimer's and uh, Polly with concussion with, with the studies, which Keith Thomas is actually involved working in that at the moment as well. Um, uh, you know, with concussion, it's it's um, probably topical. the most serious issue facing sport in general. Uh, we've just got to wait and see with, with what knowledge comes out there more and more. Winnie, but great, obviously, just greatly appreciate your time. Obviously, love your time with Nord Footy Club and. Yep, you were my first footy hero. Greatly appreciated, too, mate. All right, Malcolm. Thanks for that. Thanks, boys. Thank you, mate. Thank you for uh, right. for uh, giving us some insight today. That was absolutely fantastic. All right, All right gents. Thanks, too, mate. Mate, we've just had John Win on, and what a fantastic interview uh, all the way from Perth, and thank, you, thank him for giving us his time tonight. Oh, he's a quality man, John, and look, he really gets it, his care and compassion and that, you know, you obviously you know, hadn't spoken to him before, Pete, and yes. you probably learned a fair bit there about Absolutely. the man. And, yeah, look, it's just everything. And there's never anything too hard, too much out of the way. Look, I contacted uh, uh, John to let him know about Ben Jeffries playing his 100th game uh, as the number 28. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he contacted Ben 
I'll admit it was probably about quarter past half past twelve that night. We'd played West Adelaide at Richmond. Uh, ben just couldn't believe that John Winner contacted him and you know, the thank you, thank you, capital letters uh, through a message through. The other half probably wasn't happy with the, the, the uh, noise going on at about half past 12, yep. but these things happen. They do. My biggest takeaway was that he was very passionate about the, yeah. the current generation passing on that success and that uh, that club spirit to the next generation to help them be successful as well. As I've said about... I don't think... There's not that many people who truly, truly get it. My that, That's my term. And when he does, he sees the whole picture probably as good... As anyone, yep. as I said, leadership wise for mine, yep. he's up there with Ian Chapel. Absolutely, and he mentioned obviously Aishi Maka, yep. uh, Kingo. Kingo. I think he certainly is in that uh, Mount Rushmore group that we keep talking about. Nice. Fantastic, great man. Liking this podcast? Please like, rate, and subscribe. Past players. Past legends. Past legends. Our special guest today is Rodney Maynard. G'day, how are you? Welcome, Rocket. Thanks, Malcolm. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. So let's let's go back to uh, originally. So you moved down to Adelaide to board at Prince Alfred. And when you first started at Nord, mate? Yes, I did. I, I played in the Prince Alfred first 18 and um, and then it followed into the under-17s in the same year. We played about oh, five five games pre, pre um, um, PAC, you know, first 18 stuff. And then we went back and played finals. And I was lucky enough to play under Ian Stafford in those days. And we finished fifth in the... Um, Finals and ended up winning the flag in 1983. Yes, and I. So, Sir Maynard was a very important part of that. Yep. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, um, I had a terrific final series. I had a really good end of the season and in the last, and, and a really good final series. And, and that really negotiated my movement in the next 12 months. And, and obviously, 1984, you uh, debuted uh, against Glenelg. Yes, I did, yeah. As a 17-year-old? As a 17-year-old, yeah. People don't realise I was as young as that when I started, but people say, you know, the Macintoshes and all that went from 17 straight into league footy. Well, I was one of those too, but because I I don't think I continued on with league footy, I I stepped back, well, I struggled then for probably, I don't know, 18 months, I suppose you would say, and then until I got myself really going again in about 87, I started to really... You know, stamp my authority on league footy, but I kind of was in and out. Well, I played up until the, I think it was the 16th or 17th round of the 1984 and yep. moving into finals. But I kind of, I was just struggling for a bit of form late there and got dropped. And David Payne took my half forward flank and I couldn't win it back. We played in the reserves grand final. And as you know, the league went on and won for a fifth spot too. So. Yeah, well, yeah. Payne certainly had his influence uh, then, and you know, Glenn Vardaniga was the other one who came in late, and it was probably out of you and Glenn then, you know. Uh, so you're yep. probably a bit unlucky, and then of course you played in the uh, superstar reserve sides in '85 and '86, where yeah, yep, and played in a couple of premierships there, but yeah, reluctantly didn't work hard enough, and I, I, it's a couple of years I regret, and I mean everyone has regrets in their footy career, and that was two years I. Felt like I'd wasted, you know. I'd, I'd, I'd stay, you know, got got to the level where I wanted to, and I, I couldn't sustain it. I don't know whether it was just because I was young and a bit, yeah, a bit. And <laughs> then the uh, the light bulb meeting virtually with Wally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was pretty important. I think for me, I was I was nearly ready to come home, to be honest with you. And Wally said, "Well, have you really given it a fair go?" And I was there going, "Oh, what do you mean?" And he goes, "Well, I don't realistically." I, you know, I, I think you started well, but you've dropped off. You know, where's your, you know? And he said, well, why don't you get fitter and have a real, you know, real go at it, a real crack at it? And I kind of looked at him and said, well, oh, I kind of thought, well, I went home with my tail between my legs and thought, well, Wally Miller wouldn't say that to you if he didn't mean it. So he said it with authority and said, well, I want you to have another go and a proper go. So 
I came home and got myself super fit. And, yes, and that's an I understatement. And I, and I also told them I wanted a, a change. I've always, I, I played forward all my life since I was about eight years old. I played forward and I said to him, I probably need, I need a change. And I was about 20, I think. And he goes, well, why don't we play at halfback, centre halfback or fullback? And I ended up, Tommy Warhurst did his hamstring early that season and I ended up playing fullback with Breton at centre halfback. Yeah. You know, and so and things spiraled from there. So it was it was a good change, and and I ne- something I needed, and I got myself fit, and I I seemed to be able to read the game pretty well from back there, and snuck down and kicked a couple of goals too, which was always um yeah pleasurable. So yeah, that that's a great story. I mean, a lot of people obviously know you from uh, you know playing down back, and and to, to know that yeah. you started up forward is fantastic. That's yeah. uh, that's a great little story, mate. Thank you. It's a bit yeah, ironic. No. Bit ironic there too, Rocket. That that was probably Brenton's best year as well. And you just wonder if Brenton had stayed and played centre half back, how his career would have panned out as well. Oh, I agree totally. Well, he was in super form when I went to fullback and took Tommy's place. And unfortunately, he Brenton broke his collarbone. Yeah, that's right. And I kind of Tommy was fit to come back, so I got the promotion to centre half back, and Tommy went to fullback, and and then Brenton came back in as a as a ruckman then. Because Hall and Hine, as you know, Hine moved yep. on. And Hall was always, you know, he was a bit of an in- injury regular, I call it. And um, so Breton was rucking against guys like, you know, like Richard Lowner and <laughs> and Mick Redden and all those kind of guys. And was doing a fair job, I thought too, you know. So yeah, he just started to get, but he had a few, he had a few injuries that just at the wrong times, which didn't help his career. I thought he was unlucky in a lot of ways. And and for seven seasons, mate, uh, yourself and your brother drove down to to Adelaide uh, each, yeah. each week. Yeah, we did. Uh, it was a Thursday. Well, Breton didn't do the first five years. He only did eighty eight and eighty nine, and then he came home about halfway through that year. I did the first five on my own because I was coming. He was living in Adelaide and had a job in Adelaide. He kind of left the farm and um, had a job in town and gave it a fair crack. And I I was still doing the. Um, he had a 200k join on a Thursday night, and I, I'd come home and then again go back Saturdays. But then, wow. ironically, I got involved with the Wixers, like Tim and Simon. Oh, well, Tim played a bit of under 17 football, yep. and I played school footy at POC with Tim. And and he, um, I, st- I used to stay down there when we weren't busy and um, work for them on a Friday and then play and come home. So that I did that not every week, but when we were busy, but I did that sometimes, and that I appreciated the stop over too instead of doing it Thursday night and then back again yeah. Friday night or Saturday morning and then play and then go again type thing. So, yeah. What's but we that? did it seven, seven years I did it for. Yeah, I, I tell you, I, if the Crows didn't come along, I was just about ready to – yeah, I, I was all driven out just about. So, sure. yeah. what, uh, what type of mental um, uh, attitude did you need to take to that? Because that's, you know, that's a fair time sitting in the car back and forth uh, for seven years. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I don't know. I, I know the, I know the road pretty well now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but um, yeah, I don't know. I just because it's something you want to do and want to achieve. And I didn't want to leave Lamaru. I loved it home as well, and I love I love farming. I love country life. So it was. I had the best of both worlds. That's how I. That's how I should put it. So yeah. So I didn't mind hopping in the car. Mum had come with me when I'd sit on the tractors all night, and Mum had hop in with me a couple of times and. And um, give me a bit of a break, or just talk to me, and I'd, I'd drive, and she'd give me a bit of a, yeah, keep me keep me going. So I'm like when I was really tired after tractor driving all day and that. So, but it was great. I I look back and it was something that you, were, yeah, you achieved with. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. It wasn't it wasn't that bad. And I didn't, and I didn't come across any accidents, which was great. So, uh, your dedication, you know, with Mick Redden and Rick Davies and all that was pretty incredible. And and it's, I think it also showed where South Australian footy was at at that time as well. Now let's go to the Crows Rocket. Yep. And let's go to the fir- the trial game, the famous trial game against yep. Essendon. Let's not go so much to your playing, but a, a certain person in the crowd and uh, her attitude that night. Hey, oh, my wife? Yes, yes. <laughs> show. Yeah, if I got injured, I was, I was going to, yeah, I think I would have died. Yeah, I think she thought I was going to get an elbow in about the, yeah. No, I just I think an elbow just missed me. And um, it, there's one thing about uh, that game which will never ever be broken was the crowd for a trial game. Oh, 
But uh, that my hair on the back of my neck. I mean, it, you know, Hawthorn game is pretty big, but that the first initial into play Essendon in the in Adelaide with the crowd. On you know, we'd played a few trial games at Bunbury and, and yep. Kalgoorlie through the early part. But there was nothing like running out on that football park that first night against Essendon. And, and I mean, I and I was getting married the next day. I mean, how I was just in awe and the crowd, like you said, I've never seen a crowd standing on the standing on the rafters, it, was, it would have been, you know, they say 50,000. I reckon there would have been 60 there. It was just I unbelievable. Mean, at, and when I ran out, the roar, mm. I mean, we looked at each other and went, wow, this is what we've been training hard for for the last four or five months, you know, since October to get to this stage and be a part of this. I mean, it was just incredible. And playing against guys like James Hurd and, you know, Peter Somerville and, and you know, and, and um, Alessio and... and and Salmon and, you know, all those guys, it was just, it was a first initial night. And, I mean, we, yeah, it was great. And I got through. And, luckily, I sure thought I was going to get whipped. An elbow just missed me or something about with about three minutes to go. And she thought, oh, God. But but I got to the wedding, too. So, that was uh, that that was okay. And football had made it start. So, I didn't get a honeymoon, though. Graham told me I wasn't allowed to go away because <laughs> the season was about to start. But there was a lot of guys in my situation because, we didn't know the Crows was going to eventuate, and guys had booked in their weddings and and so forth earlier in the year, twelve months prior. You see, and thinking yeah, they were yep. be at Nord or and all that, and then bang, the Crows was was there. And I mean, where yeah, there was it wasn't just me. There was a few guys getting married and and all that through that period. But we had to put a delay on our honeymoons and go at the end of the season. We went away for a couple of days, and that was about it, I think. And we were back training and playing, getting ourselves ready for the first game. So. That's great. Uh, just going back to pre-season there, you know, obviously the famous um, uh, thing to happen out of that pre-season was the firewalking. Uh, were, were, you, <laughs> were you wanting to be involved with that, considering, you know, you, you run and run and run and you'd have been protecting your feet, I'm sure. Yeah, oh, well, I mean, what an outrage that was. I mean, it was N- Nigel Smart's, um, he, it was his... Um, it was his idea, so Graham thought it was a great. I mean, we were hearing stories about, you know, in the papers and on the TV. This fire walking was a new, you know, what escalade or whatever it was. You know, in the in the community and everywhere it was happening, and people were trying it and all that. And Nigel thought it would be a good camaraderie builder for the for the boys. So we went through such a rigma, such an organised session. You know, it started about one o'clock in the afternoon and. Uh, you know, watching the actual fire burn down and then going back to the, you know, to your rooms and, and then going through a process to get yourself keyed up for it, you know, like as in holding each other's arm and walking, what you're going to say when you walk through there to keep your mind off the, the coals and all that. And, and then you go back and have a look at the fire. It was about a, it was a six to seven hour process. And I mean, and then it was all there. The coals were there and we've gone up there as a group. And of course, Nigel, he was, a, he, he, you know, instigated all the fire walking. So he, he was going to go first, so he went. So he went. And I was. I reckon I was about. I reckon Rowie was in front of me. He was about fifth, and I was about sixth or seventh, I think. And we thought, we'll get. I think our idea was, let's get it over early, so we can get out. You know, get it done and get up. We don't want to be fifty second bloke. You know, to walk across there. We might have been better being later. I don't know, but <laughs> but we thought, get it done, get it in early, go. Like, yep. So I, know, I, just... I know. Ta- <laughs> I know. Sean Tasker was. He was nice and worried because I think he was up next. So Tas- yeah, I reckon. Tess was pretty happy when it got called off. Oh, well, I think we all were. Once we saw Nigel's feet, well, when Nigel walked across, I mean, he got there, which was surprising. He got over there, and um, and then he just said his feet were burning, and, and then they had a look, and, well, Graham and Bob Hammond and all that were there, and the doctors and said, well, we're going to put a stop to this. So that was the end of that. And then, But that guy, to his credit, he walked over and back and had no – Sorry, he must have been well trained, or he had hard feet, or he, yep. or he, he was certainly he had the psychology, you know, psychological effect on him to to do it. But he um, he he got across there and without a worry, and he showed us his feet and went. We were just went, wow. I mean, it can be done, but it must take a little bit of training and, like I said, a bit of hard, a bit of harder feet than we had, I think. So, but no, we didn't. Nigel was the only one, and that was the end of that. So, yep. And then next <laughs> week, the round one. Um, you know, famous yep, night. Absolutely. And a certain oh, yeah. uh, Maynard in the uh, list of leading goal kickers after <laughs> round one uh, with three yeah. goals from a back pocket. Yeah, no, nah, it was just an unbelievable. Everything fell and bounced. Whatever could happen our way, it went our way. I mean, 
decisions, umpires, I mean, the ball, everything, missed kicks, they fall in your arms. It was just one of those nights that you just, yeah, you take it. Because Essen, I mean, Hawthorne had won the um, night grand final, I reckon. Yep, yep. And plus, we beat them by 13, but they went on to win the premiership that year too, I reckon. Yep, certainly did. And uh, But, yeah, it was just one of those unbelievable. We just played above us. And that was another huge night for the footy club playing the first home game at footy park and having the crowd and yeah I mean because we had all Adelaide behind us I mean there was no port power in those days as you know and the whole you know nearly the whole Adelaide was behind us and um, yeah it was it was a fantastic win as I said you know winning beating Hawthorne 23 to 9 or whatever it was and yeah we're like I said I just fell into a few vacant areas in the forward line and the ball would land on your chest or bounce in your direction and you got lucky and yeah no it was just one of those fantastic nights. So I said there wasn't. I don't think anyone played bad that night. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was certainly the hottest ticket in town. That's for sure. Sorry. It was certainly the hottest ticket in town for sure. Oh, absolutely! No, it was unbelievable. But to if you went, if you go back a step, if you go back a step, then I mean, the week after, I think we played Carlton. either St Kilda or uh, Carlton. Carlton. Got, yeah. oh, sorry, Carlton. Carlton. Was it? And we got thumped, didn't we? Oh, we lost by about six in the end. That was. I've always felt sorry for Tommy Warhurst out of that because, you know, he, he was just honest where he said, oh, you know, he'd had duels against Kernahan and, you know, yeah. Sticks had be- beaten him a few times. And yeah. I think Curls in particular was the one who took exception to that. And it was incredible. Yeah. That was virtually the end of Tommy's career at Adelaide. It was bizarre, really. Yeah, yeah it was. I, I stood um, Spalding, I think. I had Spalding that night, uh, yeah, or that day, and he had Coonahan, I think. So, yeah. Yeah, I didn't think Tommy had a bad day, to be yeah. honest with you. I thought it was ridiculous. And 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 which uh, which goal out of that first game was uh, was your favourite personally? Oh, uh, well, I, probably the crumbing one. I just came forward in through the half or flank, and, and the ball just fell from the crumb, I think. And I just scooped it up, and I think I drove it about fifty, I think, and and went went through the middle. And the second one, bad. I just I timed it. I read the read it just right, Eddie. Just was going to reel around on his right and he came back, the bloke just stopped him and he came back and I was coming inside and I got a handle on the left-hand side inside and, and popped that one through. And then the last one was Darren Smith who just popped it over. I just kind of dribbled into the forward line and no one ever followed me in and I just stood there for about, felt like half an hour there on my own and he just popped it over to me and I drilled that one through. But probably the crumbing one, the first one, you know, being the first one, two in AFL, um, and I just, yeah, it was just one of those lucky, and I just screened through and broke the pack and and thumped it through. It was a, yeah, that was probably my favourite one. Interesting that first year, you probably played the plus one role a bit. You were ahead of your time, and I think King O King O Taylor may well have driven driven that idea. And yeah. yeah, if anyone suited to that role, it was you with your running ability. And yeah, yeah, yeah oh no, I. I did it. I loved it. He just, they thought I could just, I was read. I mean, I could read the game well and when to go and not to go. And, you know, and, and I feel like I had that, a bit of a gift that way. So, and I could feel like I knew when I, I was going to, feel like I knew when I could get the footy or, or get it to, you know, come back inside or I get to the stage where, you know, you could read it properly and that, you know, you knew where you were going to be when the, where the ball fell or come back inside, you could dribble forward at the right time. So, I enjoyed that role. I did. I, I took a few chances, but uh, well, I mean, it was just a yeah. I love I love to play, put defence into attack. You know, quickly. That's what my aim was. Yep. You were certainly ahead of time. Uh, you know, that's that's the stock standard these days. That rebound off of half back oh, for sure. It is. Yeah. And no, I. Yeah. No. Well, I certainly. That's why I think because I, I I wanted to go back, but I still wanted to I wanted to be a part of the forward too. You know, get through forward, half forward, and you know, try and crack a line or two and, and get through as well. So that was my aim. I didn't want to be a deadbeat fullback who stayed at home all the time or a centre-half back who just had six possessions and, and had 13 spoils or something like that. I wanted to run off and, and I, I wanted to get some ball as well. You know, that was my uh, I, that was my theory. Get, get you know, get some touches and, and um, yeah, w- win the footy if I could too. I mean, a lot of those good players took you to the ball too. You know, I stood the Chris Grants and those type of blokes and the Stewie Lowe's. Well, you knew you were in the contest every time anyway because they just take you to the footy, those blokes, every time. So you're in the game all the time, which was great. I loved it. So, Of course, you were the first player the Crows played of 50 games. And then you got injured, I reckon it was against Sydney on memory. 
yep. in 93. Then you came back from injury in the finals. And yep. I've always had the debate with you. I still think you had a very good prelim, a very good final prelim final against Essendon where you, you've always been hard on yourself for that. And yeah. I still think yeah. you did a very good job on Hurd and, and that. And, yeah. Yeah, oh, my first half was all right, but I mean, everyone's second half was. I can't watch it though. I mean, I yes. cannot sit and watch it. I mean, I, I mean, I had a. Well, I didn't play. I yeah, I broke my collarbone and I got myself back. Well, I wasn't. I can tell you now, I wasn't a hundred percent. I I struggled. I, I played one and then I came and then I I played Hawthorne late in the season, and then I missed another week because I got hurt. Gary Ayres ran into my shoulder like again, and I, I felt like I'd broken again, and I thought, oh, I'm in trouble and. And then I went back to Norwood and played, and um, played against South Adelaide at Footy Park, and had a had a good game, like had a thirty five touch game or thirty three touch game, I think. And and then I went over to watch the Hawthorne final the next day as an emergency, and um, and then I didn't, and then they picked me the week after to play Carlton at, out at the Waverley, and we kicked eight goals twenty. Yeah. And um, yeah, Mods kicked one goal six, which never happened through the whole season. He wow. kicked well, you know, 129 straight goals all season. And then that day, he kicked about one six or one seven, I think. And we um, we got done. We should have won that one. Really, I felt like we had enough of the footy. Oh, and we I had, had a reason, lot of the ball. Reason to say that we had so much of it. And then yeah, and we and when yeah, well, we played the best probably half of footy we played for three years. You know, when we were at the Crows, that half was, you know. That was just fantastic footy, you know. It was, it was just a great vibe in the change. And, and I, I honestly think we, um, we thought we were through. You know, we played yeah. a, our best footy in a half. We were unstoppable. You know, everything was just, you know, moving, and we were kicking goals. And I mean, we were seven goals up at half time, and we went in and thought, well, I think we were playing the next week already, which yeah. was a bit early. Mm-hmm. And who, I think Gra- sorry, Graham. Man. Sorry, yeah, Graham tells me the story that he wish he would if he had half time again he would have changed it all he just went in I think he thought the same thing he thought he was he was he got ahead of himself too which we all did too it wasn't just his fault but he just said I got ahead of myself too I was thinking about next week and 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 didn't come in with a you know we must stick at our effort you know we're going you know we're going really well we do this and we and then and then as you know it was the Michael Long story after that after half time he just he got them going and I mean and the way they went and we couldn't hold them like yeah I mean, if Jars kicked that goal after yeah. half time, maybe it, things might have changed. That would have been eight goals up. Early you third know, first quarter. two minutes yeah. of the third quarter, he could have dropped. And he was only 10 out, you know. And <sighs> if he'd put that through, it would have been eight up. And that might have dropped their whole, you know, they might have dropped their bundle, you know, by then yeah. and said it was too hard. But they found a way to get back. And I think we dropped it by 11 points in the end. So that was, yeah, I mean, that one they got away. That was a grand final they got away. That that was achievable, winning a grand final that year. Easy. Yeah. Yeah, we could have we could have beaten Carlton, so no Definitely. doubt about that. And and yeah. who who would you say in your AFL career was your your toughest opponent? No, oh, or best opponent a, you played against? Yeah, I mean, I stood all those bigger guys. I mean, like I said, Spalding. I mean, I even got to stand Lockett a couple of times, or a match and a half. And I stood Brereton, and and I stood Stewie Lowe. He was always difficult. You know, his hands and his marking ability was. Hard work. I got Kerry early in his career, so he wasn't he wasn't quite there. I call it. He didn't have the work ethic when I stood him, so I didn't have too much trouble with him. But the next, I'm glad I wasn't there after '95 because that's when he really stamped his authority on uh, fair footy. <laughs> he um, got himself going, but I stood him as a younger, bit immature, I think he was, and but he certainly became well. He, as we know, he was a great player. Mm-hmm. So, and I got and Chris Grant, I I, I rate him highly too. He was. A terrific player too, and and all that as well. So I got to stand a lot, but I, I don't know. They're all different. So and yeah, the famous the that. famous story, oh. Rocket. Come on, let's let's uh, have your your side of it. The famous Locket story, telling you, uh, oh. you know, go for it, Rocket. <laughs> oh well, uh, it was just one of those. I mean, he he already kicked eight, I think it was, and it was halfway through the third quarter, and I think well, Danny Hughes had had a go, and he got hurt. I think Tony ran over him with a with a hip and shoulder and he was off he, he went off on a stretcher I think and then Nigel had a go and and then and then he, he got a couple kicked on him I think and so and then I got and then Trevor Jakes was heading my way and I've gone, Oh no, here we go. <laughs> here we go and Trevor goes, Yes, Rodney, you're going back on locket and I'm going, Oh, oh, oh Trevor, no. Ouch. Trevor, no. And he goes 
and I so I went back there and and I the first ball came in and you know in the olden days you used to grab their guns so I could climb up his back a bit and um, and punch it away you know just to support yourself so you don't fall off him yeah. or so you grab their guns and you keep them nice and close and you punch it away and he just looked at me stood at me and stared at me and said oh, if you're if you ever hang on to my Guernsey again, you, you know what you know what happened to Danny Hughes? And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, well, and he goes, well, he went off on a stretcher, didn't he, mate? That, that'll, be you, that'll be you. That will be you in five minutes if you're going to hang on my Guernsey. So, I, I think Lockett had told that to a few guys, <laughs> to be honest oh, with you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I wasn't the only one. Yep. What, what, what happened to poor old Peter Cajun? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I stood off him and then uh, – and, um, yeah, tried. But he only kicked a couple on me. But then I got another go at him at Footy Park about, I don't know whether it was the same year or the year later, because we had a few out too. And, I, of course, Graham threw me the task to go back to full back on Tony as well. And, yeah, that was a tough gig. I mean, I um, I, I was well, um, well, I mean, I felt like I had a fair game, you know. And, and I didn't know how many he kicked, but he kicked 10 anyway. <laughs> and we still won. And we still won the game. But I, I felt like, oh, well, I had 20 possessions too. I thought I had a pretty, you know, pretty high, you know, took nine marks or something. And I thought, God, I didn't have a bad go. But I, I thought he might have kicked six, seven maybe. But then I looked up on the school at the end of the game and he's kicked 10. And I've gone, oh, God, that deflated me. <laughs> Fair enough to so, But he, but that was just, I mean, they always look for him. He was, even if it was a 10-meter kick, he, and if he did, if they didn't kick it to him, whew, did they get told. That's how, that's how much he drew the ball. Yeah. You know, he was just, he just drawed it to him. And if they didn't kick it to him, oh, they'd get that look, you know, that stare down. Like he had that, he had that in, impact on, on their class as well. So. And the frustration, yeah. Rod, Rocket, when you ended up going back and forth with Nord and the bizarre yeah. night. And it was actually the yeah, that famous was, Gary that... McIntosh night against Centrals at Footy Park where you sat on the bench the whole night. Yeah. Yeah. It was tough. I, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I, 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 I don't know what Craigie was. I don't know whether he had the crows in the gun. or I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, mean, I love Norwood Footy Club, and I tried to keep telling him that. But he'd want to meet with me every Friday night and talk to me about, you know, he was worried that I wasn't, wasn't there for the right reasons. And I, I said to him, well, I'm not at the crows. I mean, this is the only other club I'd ever want to play for. I said, Norwood's my home, you know, but... But I sat on the bench I for 10, probably longer. I probably sat on the bench for 14 weeks. I, I admit, uh, Rocket, Sorry. that when, I admit when I did interview Craigie for you know, the article in my book on Craigie, I yeah. I did well and truly make that point that you know, Rocket was red and blue blooded. I said, Jesus, Craigie, that was bloody ridiculous. And yeah, it was an interesting conversation. Look, he, yeah, he... He did. You're right. He seemed convinced that Rowie was the one, was the red and blue one. And yeah, I, to this day, I vehemently disagree with Neil on that one. Yeah. 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 Oh well, I do. Too. I was. I was rubbish. Well, one week I can tell you. Well, it happened about 13 weeks in a row. All all the season, he put me on. He wouldn't put me on for the first half. But I, I'd have to sit there and bide my time. And every time at half time, he'd say, "Right, I may not half or play." I'll go right. Thanks, Neil. And the way I go, and every week I'd have fifteen plus like it possessions every week. You know, I was I was playing. I'd go on and I'd go on with the right attitude, and I, I was and I kicked two or three every week. So, and I thought, God, I was, I'm I'm in I'm in, I'm, in, I'm not in bad touch, you know. I honestly thought, God, I'll start next week. Maynard, you're on the bench, yeah, right? Crazy. So I sat there. Well, then after about six weeks, he rang me and said, on a Friday night after we'd spoke, and he said, Ah. Uh, Made a decision. Going to play in the reserves today. This is down at Glenelg. We're going to play in the reserves. And I've gone, what? He goes, oh, well, I'm just thinking that you need a full game and we're going to play in the reserves in the centre. I'm there going, oh, I didn't comment. I just said, righto, whatever. I said, what's the report time? Well, then I get an am call back about an hour later. He goes, Perry's pulled out. You're, you're in, in the league side. And I'm going, oh, beauty, I'm starting. No, you're on the bench. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> wow. And I've gone, oh, righto. And I went on and had 18 possessions that day too at the Bay. And Well, then it got towards the end of the season and, and the finals. Well, then I, I was full, full noise. He said, right, you're starting. You know, it was about the 20th round. He said, right, you're starting. You ruck roving with McIntosh, you know, on a half or a flank. I've gone, you beauty, you know. 
and we, you know, we we got to the prelim that year, but yeah, I got I got badly hurt in that game in that prelim, and and I struggled after half time. I think I had a corky that was as I probably wouldn't have played the next week anyway. I was I was bleeding that badly, and and, and big Matthew Promise tied on my toe. I broke my big toe. That's right. Wow. In the second quarter, I had to have injections in that at half time. Said doctors, put put a needle in there, just give it and just numb it up so I can play. And but. My corky certainly. I was I was pretty well buggered. I was struggling big time, and but yeah, I was yeah. But I don't think I don't. I know. I mean, Macca and I get on really well, but I, I think Macca thought I wasn't there for the right reasons as well. Until I started playing a few games and you know and gritting my teeth and digging in like I would for Norwood any any match. And I think he said he apologised to me about a few days later and said, "No, I know you were having a crack, and I, I apologise." And and it wasn't you were there for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. So I said, "Oh well, I'm, I'm just glad you know I was." I mean, I, yeah. I didn't want people to think I was there for. I didn't want to be at Norwood because Norwood was my club. I said, "I, I love the Norwood Footy Club." But I, yeah, well, look, I can I, remember you and I having a beer together that night discussing the future, and yeah, yeah, I do remember that very vividly. Of course, I used to spend a bit of time at your place, and Cheryl may have said on a few occasions, hadn't didn't I have a home to go to? And I said, oh, I'm quite happy here, thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. I yeah, probably I'll wasn't talk- her favourite person there for a while, mate. Ah, oh, well, mate, you she knew how I love talking football anyway. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, she's had to live it with the we live it with the whole life, but she's she's enjoyed every minute of it because I got to meet so many people and she's been on my side and I get she gets she's had some good some terrific times as well. Don't you worry. Like she says, she gets mad with me talking footy, but I mean she loves coming and and meeting people as well. So yeah, she's enjoyed that side of it. So uh, obviously after leaving uh, the AFL and 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 Norwood, you head back home to Lamaroo. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I, underneath, I couldn't wait because I mean, I think, I mean, Norwood and that, I would have loved. I mean, I nearly stayed for another year under Peter Road. I, 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 I nearly did, but I, I, I said I wanted to make the commitment back to the farm because Brett and Dad were buying more land, and I said I always wanted to come home, and there was property, you know, corresponding with our next to our property, you know, and and we were, it was silly not to buy them at the time because we wanted to get bigger, and so I said, no, no, I was ready for home, but. I, and but then um, I think Colin is it Colin Rickus? It was either president, um, is it Colin or Norwood president? Yeah, Rickus. Um, Rick, Rickus was it? Yeah. Rickus. Um, That's annoying me now. I feel terrible, Rocket. But yeah, keep, I do. Keep going. Do. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. He um, he came as president and drove up and saw me and he said, "I'll come up and get you every week. I'll come and drive you there." Because I said, "Oh, you know, I did a lot of driving in my time. I don't really want to start driving." He said, "I'll come and get you." We'll fly you down some weeks. It'll be all right. We'll get you there. You know, just play another season for us. You know, and I'm like, oh. But I did. I didn't in the end, and I, I probably ruined it. I wish I stayed another year yeah. or two because, yeah, I wish I did. But because I think Peter Rode not. Well, I got on really well. He came and saw me as well and wanted me to play, and I got on with him really well too. And, and I do now. You know, I met him a couple of times again, and we we do get on. Well, I wish John wish John Rickus. Yep. John Rickus. That's yes. it. Yep. And um, yeah. So, but I didn't in the end. But I I. Underneath, I wanted to come home and play with Breton, and 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 I had a lot of mates here that that were farmers, and that I left twelve years prior and hadn't played with them, and and some really good mates that I still were involved with because I was still living at home a lot, especially at Norwood. And then when I went to Adelaide to live for five years, well, I still come home and see them and watch games, and and I, I was just looking forward to playing with some old mates and my my local club, and I. I'm glad I did make the decision. I I loved it. I enjoyed it. And we won a flag the first year, which was because I was driving the women. They'd won two already. And I and I, I kind of think I got them up again because I was that keen. They kind of said, oh, it's only a grand final. And I'm there going, well, hey, you know, mate, I haven't won one for 10 years. But, like, you know, I'm I'm ready. <laughs> like, yeah. So I pushed hard and, and um, we got there and, we won quite a few in that that first five or six year period that I was home. I think we won five out of seven or something. I think or five only, out of. So you played two hundred and six games for Lamarie, you know, which is incredible. You've played well over. It's nearly four hundred and fifty senior games in the end, effectively. Yeah, yeah. I, I probably played a lot more than that too, with trial games and, and escort cup games that they didn't count, and and a lot of other, and and then all my association games and state country. That's not included in all them either. So, so six six, six male, male medals. medals. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And Brenton yeah, as well. I like, yeah, I mean, like, I was lucky. Brenton kind of he was older and he was he won the well it was with the Maynards hogged it for a while there. He won the four before I came home, and then I won 
six after I was home, and so we kind of hogged the show for a while. Put but, a mortgage um, on it. Yeah, we did, and um, yeah, oh, I was lucky. I mean, I I came home, bit you know, I, I'd never been as fit as I was, and I came home and playing against you know footballers of the caliber of most of the AFL footballers. You come home with you know your stronger vibe, you know, you feel like you're stronger and and fitter, and you know. You, you're hungrier and yeah, so that that helped. I mean, the first four or five years, I was still, you know, I was only 30. When I come home, I was only 30. You know, I was in my prime, really. I felt like you learn a lot about the game and, you know, and, and all that. I wasn't ready to coach straight away. I wanted to just come home and play and just enjoy it again, you know, so. Rocket, let's go back to on your running side of things. Is it true that or myth that you actually got banned by the Crows at one stage from running because your body fat ratio had started to get too low. It was. I lost a lot of weight. I was down to 83 or 84. And I should have been up around the 88 to 90. And I just got myself extremely fit and healthy. And, and I got myself a bit light, but I was still fit. I wasn't unwell or anything. I, but they just, yeah, they told me I, I was just, well, I was working hard too at Wixies in the summertime there at pre-season. I was out in the sun and, and shoveling, you know, digging trenches and and all that as well. So, I mean, it wasn't easy to put on weight out there either, you know. So they made me stop working there as well because I went back and worked for Wixie for a couple of years, you know, my mate, and that when I was at the coast because I painted for the first couple of years with Roger and Rowie and then I went and worked with Wixie just for a change and then and they, they more or less told me I wasn't allowed to work out there anymore because I was working too hard and I was coming to training too tired and, and flat and... And that well, I did some days. I was knackered because we were digging, and and I was a farmer. I just used to work and and all that. But it was taking its toll on, and training as well, and and my footy a bit, I think. But and like I said, I couldn't put on, seem to put on any power, you know, power weight and that. So I did get myself probably too fit. Well, I just become a running machine. That's what I become. I was swerdy and me and lip tack and that. We were just, you know, any excuse we'd get, we'd run, you know. But we were fit. You know, we There's still the marks ground. on Paint and Oval from you from all your running you did there, yeah, mate. I, yeah. I joined you occasionally, but I certainly never kept up with you for too long. That's what no, all those no. wear marks are. <laughs> no, I loved it. I, st- I, I did it for a lot when I came home too. I only just stopped when I was 50. I used to run right up until I was about 50. In the last five years, I've probably slowed up a bit. and I do a lot more walking nowadays, but in those first few years, I used to run into Lamaroo. My farm was 17 k's out, and I used to run the Lamaroo, you wow. know. And, and sure, I'd sure I'd work. You know, I'd I'd knock off and run in at four o'clock, take me an hour and twenty or something, and then I'd um, and go home with her. Then you know, to keep myself fit and that as well. Wow. So and and obviously I, I, um, at the moment, mate, um, the uh, La- uh, Mali League uh, unfortunately has um, ceased to exist. Yeah, well, it's in the process. Um, yeah, Nick, it's um, it, it's all happening now. I mean, we've just got to be accepted by the River Murray and I mean, Karunda and well, Bo- as you know, Borders left us in the lurch. Or well, left us about, you know, they were on the move about oh, three, four months ago. They said they were going to quit the league, and um, that kind of put pressure on us. And then, well, we thought we were going to go in with the five teams competition then with Karunda and and Peak and Lamaru Pinaru Marvel, but then Karunda came to us. Oh, it was just after the grand final and said, well, realistically, we feel like we cannot get a side on the park next year with volunteers and numbers and all that. We're done, I think. There'll be no 2023 for the crew in the footy club. So it all started a process and we thought, well, hell. And then they'd obviously spoken to Peak and then it all evolved from there. And, and then they said they were going to... So we were left down to three teams, which wasn't going to work here. Like, I mean, Marvel, Pinaru, Lamaru. So... We jumped on and spoke to Pinaru and said, well, we better get something moving here. We, we better talk and, and get things moving if we're going to decide to um, merge and, and go together and, and move on. And then Marvel decided, well, they were going to go into the Murray Valley, Murray Valley Footy League, which is the independent league. So, no, we're in the process of now getting our colours and, and getting accepted into the River Murray, which will make their team a 19 competition with 18, with, not, with uh, 16 rounds. So you'll play each side twice. And then you'll have there's a buyers involved as well, and then there'll be um, so it'll be a 19 week competition over with those nine teams, and um, yeah, so that's what it'll be. But we haven't been accepted yet, but it's all the SNFL won't not let it happen. And, and our merge was we thought we'd go to the Riverland because we had access from Alawoona up through there, 
Pinaroo had access that way. But the vibe in our community was to go to the west, which was to the River Murray, because then they could push on to Adelaide. A lot of kids at colleges, at school, and, and they could shop yep. and go back home and, and, and all that. So the vibe, well, 70 to 80% of the vibe was to go that way. So we've, that's where we're going to apply for. So the Riverland won't get our company. We've, it'll go to the River Murray. So and Pinaroo and us are in the process of now to getting our name, colours, and I'm on the recruiting. We're getting all our recruiting. I'm just about to speak to Nick Hyde. He rang me before. I meant to ring him back in a minute. And he's um, we're in re- busily recruiting some players at this stage to come back and represent whatever we're called. I mean, my the Maynard I, Menzel Football Club. <laughs> sorry, no, the, the Maynard Southern, Menzel Football Club. I would have thought. Yeah, Southern Mallee Giants. How's that sound? Yeah, it sounds yeah. okay. There was a yeah. little post uh, going around online. The the Mallee Bulls. Yeah, well, the Mallee, but we don't know what Karunda and um, Karunda and Peak are going to do yet. So we just got to probably find out a little bit of information what he, what they're heading to, and then we. But we were talking if we went to the Giants, we could use the GWS Guernseys, and because there's no one in the River Murray that way, that's what I'm thinking anyway. But they, yeah, that makes sense. They, they, they might the survey might show other colours and different names and all that. But they had it out there the other night, and we Cheryl and I said the Southern Mallee Giants, and I thought the GWS colours are pretty good, and, and they're. You know, easily off the shelf, you know, your orange scarves and, your, you know, and, and all that stuff. It's the memorabilia. You can get it a bit easy if you go and have a club that, you you know, yeah. that's in the NFL or something. So, and, and it'll work in the River Murray. But that might change because, I mean, I'm only one voice. So, yeah. Rodney, one more serious question about the whole country sporting side of things, not just footy. As yeah. we know, country, you know, populations decreasing in the country, you know, machinery taking places, jobs, all that. And... I just don't think the AFL, et cetera, realise just how vital sport is to a country community. Basically, oh. you know, if a person doesn't get involved in sport in the country, they're eventually ostracised and they don't become a member of the community. And the whole mental health side of things and that I just think is being grossly underestimated at yeah. AFL, government level and all that, just how important sport is. And, yeah, I, I certainly don't know a solution, but I just... I just can't believe that there's not more support being given overall to country sports. I'm not just talking oh, footy. They took their grassroots footy and all this, and now if you'll get heaps of money and put it back into the country, well, I mean, our sports, summer sports here are shot, like our cricket team. We have not got a cricket team in Lamar now. We barely have a tennis team, and we and now we won't have any footy, really. Well, we have footy here four weeks of the year and four at peak, but foot, there's just sport here. I mean, and we need it. And in, yeah. I mean, I don't need to talk about this out, out of regard, but it's just mental health too. People love socialising and getting out and talking about their, you know, their farming. And, and, and it's so important for country people to get out. I mean, if we all stayed home and worked every week, well, there's going to be a lot more. There's going to be a lot of trouble, I feel. But, I mean, summer sport's tough. I mean, we just haven't got any commitment here anymore. That We haven't got the numbers. I mean, I was playing my under-16 Colts team this year, senior Colts. I only had six regulars. So we were playing these combined games, you know, against, you know, with Peak and Lamaru combined against yeah. Karunda and Borders and, and, and Border Downs. Things like that, to try and get 16 or 18 on a foot field so they'd have a competitive game. I mean, that was working ironically. But the parents, that's the main key why we're changing our league too is because we're merging with another league is because we've got no juniors. And, yeah. I mean, parents are worried about the kids not getting good enough and, Enough footy, so and I can understand that immensely because if I was there playing and playing six aside or seven aside, well, it just feels like they're not going to get any better, and they want to go to a league where there's numbers and you know where they can get better and and play. So that's our biggest issue here is our juniors. Our senior footy was going along all right, but it was our under sixteen level that was uh, depleted. And 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 I said before, you know, I just think we need footy in country in country towns because Massively. it's going to quieten up our town. You know, if we it's even going to make it. When we go to the River Murray, I mean, you know, we do come back here, like I said, a few weeks and that, but the town is going to quieten down and get quieter. I mean, yeah. And it's just not the numbers around now. I can't believe that there's just no senior cults. There's the juniors, you know, they're playing with 12 or 13, you know. We just can't feel 18 the sides. Not, not like Scary. 10, 15 years ago. It's, and cricket, tennis, they're all, it's all, even golf, you go and play golf, there's only, you know, you might get 16 out for the Saturday. And it's not great. I mean, yeah, sport in the country is depleted completely. And, I mean, football, yeah, I just think that, I mean, the AFL could have did more, but I don't know, what can you do more about numbers? So yeah. That's, it's my biggest question. So, yeah. yeah. There's certainly no obvious solution. 
No, there's not. No, no, no. There's, I mean, we can bitch and holler about them and, and yeah, but if, if there's no numbers, you can't do anything without numbers, can you? So, I mean, we'll just have to move on and hopefully it makes it better for the kids down in, in the River Murray and we can get 16 or, you know, 15 or 16 on the side, you know, if we can, because there'll be three juniors down there, under 18, 15s and 13s, I think it is, or something. I'm, I'm not sure what they've come up with. They used to have four, but it's going to go back to three, I think, So because of numbers and that. In, and, and they're having trouble in the River Murray too. They can't feel full sides either. So it's not just us out no. here, you know, 200 kilometres away. It's teams that, it's towns that are 100 kilometres away from Adelaide as well. It's happening everywhere, yeah. Rocket, as you and yeah, you and I and that have always loved to chat about footy. And, uh, yep. yeah, look, Hall of, member of the South Australian Footy Hall of Fame, Nord Hall of Fame, you know, being there the night when you were inducted in the Nord Hall of Fame, yep. obviously you know how much... Nord Footy Club, etc., and, and the yeah. Crows, and that mean to you. Greatly privileged having you aboard tonight, Rock. No worries. No, thanks, guys. Love to have a chat. You know that. Love to talk footy. <laughs> Thank you, Rocket. It's been an absolute pleasure to uh, to go down memory lane with you and, and, and discuss a few things, obviously, uh, about you personally. But, yeah, we, we really wanted to touch base about the Mallee League, and we're sorry to see that, uh, that, that country sport is just struggling a little bit at the moment. Thanks, That's Robert. right. Oh, we'll be going down to Murray Bridge and, and giving it all we got. We're going to make sure we, we, we're not making up the numbers. We'll be, we'll be taking it pretty seriously and knocking a few doors down if we can. So, no, thanks, you guys. That's great. So thanks, Robert. Look forward to catching up in the footy season, mate. See you, mate. Liking this podcast? Please like, rate, and subscribe. And that, that was our uh, special guests. I'd like to thank both of our special guests, uh, Rodney Maynard and John Wynn, for their time earlier on in our uh, podcast series. What an absolute pleasure to talk to those guys and, and start off the new year with some positivity with those guys. But more importantly, uh, Malcolm and I are back on the airways next week for our first live show of 2023. And we're hoping to bring a little bit more of an extended coverage to our podcasts in future by adding a bit of a video element. We'll see how we go with that over the next couple of weeks. We've got to get some equipment finalised, but once it's up and running, you'll be able to not only hear us on the airwaves, but you'll be able to see us as well. Until then, thank you very much. Happy New Year to all of our lovely, lovely listeners. And um, we'll see you next week for our first live episode of 2023. In this crazy world we live in, we all need the distraction. Enjoying the show? Like, rate, and subscribe. Hook up and connect with us on social media at Sportscast SA. We'll see you next time on Game On.